Hello, and welcome to another edition of Brussels Sprouts. I'm Andrea Kendall-Taylor. And I'm Jim Townsend, coming to you from Paris. From the streets of Paris. And we're so glad you can join us. Back at the end of February, French President Emmanuel Macron once again created shockwaves, this time with a statement that the West should not rule out sending troops to Ukraine, a statement that elicited widespread criticism in large part because it forced many NATO members to promptly clarify that they have no intention of putting their troops in Ukraine, sending the wrong signal to Putin and the Kremlin. The statement came to as a surprise to many who had previously viewed France as lagging behind in its support to Ukraine. But supporters of Macron have highlighted that the statement about sending troops to Ukraine should not have come as a surprise, but rather that it reflects an evolution in France's approach towards Moscow since Russia's invasion. In the initial months following the invasion, Macron continued to engage diplomatically with Putin. Macron's dialogue with Putin, along with controversial statements, including his insistence that the West must not humiliate Moscow, drew harsh criticism from many of France's NATO allies. Since then, though, there is evidence that Macron's posture has evolved. Many look back to his speech in Bratislava in May 2023 as an important point. Macron essentially apologized for France's failure to listen to the warning of its Central and Eastern European allies about Russian intentions saying that Western Europe lost an opportunity when it didn't listen to the concerns relayed by the Eastern Europeans. How significant is this shift in Paris and what should we expect from France going forward? To help us understand the thinking in France and its possible implications, we're very pleased to have with us Tara Varma and Bruno Tetre on the podcast. Welcome to you both. Hi. Thank you. you. A brief introduction, Tara Varma is a visiting fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution, and Bruno is the Deputy Director of the Foundation for Strategic Research, a leading French think tank on international security issues. Okay, Tara, let's start with you and give us your view about, or actually let's let's talk about the timeline a little bit. And if you can give us a sense of your understanding of how Macron and Paris' thinking has evolved since the invasion. Sure, thanks a lot, Andrea. It's great to be back. Um, so M- Macron, the evolution of Macron's thinking, I guess to me is, not that clear. I think the Bratislava speech that you just mentioned was uh, certainly key, but at the time, so a year ago, almost to date, it was still considered just as a speech. I think, you know, I don't think we should downplay it. I wrote a piece uh, at the time for Brookings about it. I think it is quite a sea change for Macron. First of all, he rarely apologizes. So I think in terms of the method that he usually uses, that is a pretty big change. But also he apologized to Central and Eastern Europeans and I think welcome them uh, in the European foreign policy space in a way that he hadn't done before. So I think that was interesting. But we still needed to see concretely what com- what would come out of it. Uh, last summer, once again, he said that we shouldn't humiliate Russia, that, you know, we need to, to think about the future with Russia. So we, with Macron, it's always, uh, you know, sometimes one step ahead, two steps behind. And so it's not that clear to understand. But I have to say, in this precise case, what he said on February 26th at um, the press conference following the conference on Ukraine in Paris, and I, I, you know, that I do criticize him quite often, but I feel like for once he was being consistent as a European. For As Europeans, we've been saying for the past two years that we will do whatever it takes to support Ukraine. We've been saying it as bilateral uh, and individual member states of the EU, as well as at European, institution, European Union institution level. And so I felt like by saying we shouldn't rule it out, you know, that seems like a good policy option not to rule something out. And the reaction that came afterwards Considering that he also said the first part of his proposition was there is no consensus, but we shouldn't rule it out. You know, he he was kind of actually fairly prudent. And I, I, I still struggle to understand a little bit the reactions that came after that. I mean, I do understand the, the variety of German reactions in particular and, and the fact that suddenly the idea that there would be German troops somewhere, I, I think, uh, triggers something different in Germany than it does in France, certainly. But I felt like for once it was not that crazy a proposition to, unfortunately, I, everyone hopes that it's not going to happen, but not to rule it out seems like a fairly good policy option. 
Bruno, what about you? I think we were all in a meeting very in the immediate aftermath of the statements. And I think I expressed some surprise at the statement. And I think you, Bruno, highlighted that it shouldn't have come as a surprise. So give us your view of this evolution and French thinking. Is it as unclear in your view as what Tara has laid out? Or do you see it as a more kind of, you know, clear trajectory? I largely agree with Sarah, and I think that, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, Sarah, but I I didn't think you described it as unclear. Look, this has been a slow train coming, and, uh, the you know, the, the Bratislava speech, which was a very important milestone, has been mentioned. And I think that we can trust Macron to have changed his perspective, not necessarily change his mind, because he's a very stubborn person, but uh, change his perspective in a way which is convincing, maybe more than in the past, simply because he has not backtracked. You know, as Sarah said, he's he's often you know a two step forward, uh, one step backward kind of guy. But he has not backtracked. So um, I trust his sincerity on his uh, latest move on Ukraine. Uh, and 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 like Tara, I'm, I'm often a critic. I think the. You know, the, the main reason is that there are many reasons why this happened. I think, you know, he was marked by reality, <laughs> as they say. I mean, real, the reality is that he was slow to realize, but has finally realized that you cannot trust Putin, that Ukraine is in a difficult military situation, that military assistance to Ukraine in the U.S., in Washington, is uh, coming down to a trickle, uh, that the Trump scenario is increasingly a credible one. Plus, there were additional factors that, you know, that were not necessarily in the limelight, such as, you know, direct Russian attacks against certain French interests. So I think this is, this was, this is one, sincere, and two, uh, it's durable. Um, one of the most important aspects of his policy stance on the friend, I mean, troops on the ground, sorry, not necessarily French, but troops on the ground, is the fact that he wanted to change the rules of the game and turning the tables, so to say. Uh, he thinks, I believe, that Putin sees the West as being weak and predictable, that he is currently having the best ride that he's had since you know, the end of uh, February 2022. And you know, just, just changing the narrative, turning the table, what a very important part of his... Uh, policy move, what he calls it strategic ambiguity. Uh, and I think it's not a, a, a badly named policy. Uh, just one final point on this. Just to clarify for those of your um, viewers who don't necessarily um, uh, know everything about this, it's not about French troops, it's about troops. It can be Western troops, European troops, but there's never been a sign that he would consider sending French troops in Ukraine, you could see things like French troops in Moldova, probably with Romania at some point, but that's a separate hypothesis. But uh, there's absolutely nothing which indicates that you could have French combat troops on their own. And once again, the main scenarios he mentioned during that press conference were about air defense, border protection, that sort of things, and support in general. Uh, still, and I'll finish with that, still, uh, he has uh, instructed his military staff to plan for a wide range of contingencies so that whatever the future holds, uh, the French can be ready. Yeah, I want to definitely get to the Moldova piece uh, because I think that's really interesting. But you both have talked about this as, um, I think, see, like, uh, as genuine and Bruno, you used the term durable. And I'll just say, I think up until the point that he made the statement, there has been this perception, including here in Washington, that French really has lagged behind what other NATO allies have done, given France's size, strength of military, et cetera. And so how do you how how would you expect Macron to follow through on these types of statements of commitment? With genuine actions, and I, if I'm off on the, the the first part of my statement, I'm, you know, 
happy to be corrected, but give us your sense of, of, of what you think Macron and Paris will do to follow through on statements that Macron has since doubled down on. Tara, if you want Tara to- for me. Tara, go, Tara, you start. So I think one of the first things that he did and his new foreign minister, Stéphane Sejourné, did was kind of uh, reinforce their presence to the East and with the Baltics in particular. There have been several meetings now, you know, something that we've been seeing in the past weeks that was really not obvious until a few months ago. The Balts, uh, and I would say rightly so, were very critical of Macron's uh, comments and, you know, interviews in the past The fact that you're seeing a rapprochement now, and I think a sense that Paris is really taking Eastern European concerns, preoccupations a lot more seriously, understanding that, yes, they're Eastern Europeans, but they're European concerns and preoccupations, and that's how they should be understood, I think is a first change. I would not have expected the Baltics, uh, you know, foreign ministers meeting with the French foreign minister and seeming to be on the same page. This is, again, a pretty big change, a concrete change in terms of making sure that Macron sees European foreign policy not just as France's priorities, but as true European priorities. And I I think there's been a lot of reinvestment in NATO as well. I do think Macron wants a strong European presence, a strong European offer uh, at NATO as well. And so it's... uh, I think his change is not just about Russia. It's about really how he thinks he can bring Europeans together and to make sure that there is a form of European unity here. Because as we've been saying, uh, the situation on the ground for Ukraine is pretty difficult. Um, Putin is actually benefiting from the support of a number of authoritarian leaders uh, across the world, not least the one of China. And in the narrative that we're hearing from other parts of the world than the US and Europe, there's a sense that Russia is winning this war. So I think he's understood now that there needs to be a real form of European unity here, concretely, but also in terms of the narrative that he needs to push. And that is despite the Franco-German rift that we're seeing right now. I think that overall, uh, there were form- the message from Macron was and remains uh, to Kiev, to Moscow, to Washington, and to other Europeans. Uh, to Kiev, the message was, uh, we mean it when we say whatever it takes for how long it takes. To Washington, that means, look, I'm encouraging the Europeans to uh, endorse more, I mean, to to take more of the burden. To Moscow, as I hinted at earlier on, the message was, don't expect us to be weak and predictable. And finally, to the other Europeans, including Berlin, was, guys, it, it is about the future of Europe. And by the way, for Macron, if there's one legacy issue in foreign policy, it will be about Europe. And he now gets it that his legacy on Europe is inseparable from the European legacy on Ukraine. Um, so... It's all about that. Now, Andrew, you would seem to suggest rightly that there was this expectation uh, in early uh, March that France would follow through with more, you know, defense equipment deliveries to Kiev. And this was a little bit of a misunderstanding. I think that from Macron's standpoint, this was not necessarily about defense equipment. The message was primarily political and in terms of future military options, but not primarily about defense equipment. Still, that expectation was logical. Um, the French have always been saying, yes, we're lagging behind. But when you take into account the quality and the actual deliveries and the overall financial contribution, we're not doing that badly. So that's always been their main argument, which sort of corrects, but not completely, this impression of a mismatch between France's importance in Europe and its actual uh, assistance. But then uh, a few days ago, uh, Sébastien de Cornu made a number of announcements on, in particular, the fact there would be hundreds, quote unquote, of uh, armored vehicles which would be delivered to Ukraine, not top notch quality, because usually the French wanted to send, you know, high, you know, high end military equipment in small numbers. But now when they're saying hundreds of, uh, of uh, armored vehicles, the message is, okay, we understand you need quantity as much as quality. So overall, once again, Andrea, 
Uh, I think you were right that these these expectations existed, and I understand them. But from the French standpoint, it was a little bit of a misunderstanding. What you all said was excellent, very helpful. And just a comment and then a question. The comment is, uh, I think, Bruno, what you said uh, is right. I mean, I understand the misunderstanding, et cetera. But that what's unfortunate is that misunderstanding has diluted the importance of what Macron was saying. And uh, personally, I... Uh, and we've talked about this at an earlier broad podcast. Um, I felt what he said about uh, nothing off the table, et cetera, was something that needed to be said. And I I feel bad about the the recoil coming from Germany and the U.S. and others uh, that 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 kind of undercut what he was saying. But but the dilution of the importance of what he was saying has come from people uh, saying, well, Jim, you know, the, the French aren't giving anything. You know, there's this perception out there. And that really does uh, need to be corrected somehow, um, and uh, because it just is, it's undercutting a lot of the important rhetoric coming out of Paris. It gets undercut. So my my question to you all, though, is uh, I found it really interesting that, that Blinken stopped in Paris on his way to Brussels for the foreign ministers meeting, and, and I'm sure there were some real reasons he needed to do that, probably based on coordinating positions at the foreign ministers, you know, maybe about the fund, maybe about other things. But I found it interesting, though, that he stopped here. Um, and I'm wondering if part of that was because France has become, in a, in, in a sense, uh, beginning to do what I think Macron wanted, which was to begin to lead uh, Europe in a lot of ways. And Blinken stopping here and talking probably about what Macron said and other things uh, related to Ukraine, I think was an important sign that uh, we're going to be do more, doing more coordinating in Paris than we'll be doing in London or we'll be doing in Berlin. Uh, and so my question to you all is, are you feeling the same thing? Are you feeling that his rhetoric, his, his, his change of mind, what he's been saying, what the Minister of Defense has been saying as well, that that's being picked up now in Europe, that there's beginning to be a bit of a falling in behind France um, not all the countries, obviously, and not Germany, but I mean, but still, his leadership uh, is beginning to be seen and felt. Would you agree with that? Sure. Well, I mean, I can go. I think it's not, first of all, it's not a zero sum game. I think, you know, London and Berlin and Paris and Warsaw and Riga should be doing and leading a lot more together. I think it, I'm not sure the extent to which, you know, we need to say Macron is leading. I, I know that triggers a lot of people. I think what is certain is a number of ideas that Macron has been pushing on European strategic autonomy, European sovereignty, ramping up the defense industrial base in Europe. These ideas, which, you know, let's say were perceived very uh, ambiguously in Washington for a long time, they might be perceived a bit less ambiguously, particularly as we approach the NATO summit in, in DC in July. And so the idea that Europeans are actually taking uh, their security seriously, they're taking their defense industrial base seriously, they're ramping up production, they're coming to DC with a clear European offer and a clear sense that they want to take a lot more charge of their own security, not to the detriment of the US, but actually to be a better partner to the US and to be better providers for themselves. I think that is a good change. And I think that is definitely something that wouldn't have happened in the previous U.S. administration and that it's not surprising that it's happening with Blinken too. I think there's still an expectation that Germany needs to do a lot more and to lead a lot more as well. And as I said, I don't think it should come at the expense one of the other. I think Berlin and Paris can do a lot more and present a view uh, of unity that is sorely needed right now for Ukraine and for Europe. Uh, but there is definitely a sense that a number of ideas that Macron was pushing and was seemingly alone to push for a long time have become a lot more consensual now. I don't think that Macron wants to be the leader of Europe. I don't think Europe needs a leader. Actually, it's a very American thing to believe that, you know, there has to be a leader somewhere. Uh, well, one of the leaders, but certainly, certainly he wanted to lead from an intellectual and political standpoint. Yes, I would say that, you know, in a sense, he wants France to be the indispensable power in Europe. But this came at a time, as has been mentioned before, when his personal relation with Charles is not good. And the French-German connection is not in its best of times. And this is where the Polish factor is very interesting. Because there was a successful attempt at rejuvenating the Weimar format, which is France, Germany, Poland. And in a sense, because there has been that change in government in Poland, 
that has allowed the French and the Poles together, first of all, to say, you know, to give the impression that we were not completely, uh, you know, apart, you know, uh, Berlin, Warsaw, and Paris. And also, it helps us to nudge the Germans a little bit indirectly with the help of the Poles. But that could only have happened because of the change in government. Poland. Otherwise, it could never have happened. But this is a, I have to say that these days, and like Tara, I, I criticize Macron a lot, but I think that these days, the French are playing their cards fairly shrewdly and smartly. May I add, because this is really part of the picture, the picture both from the Russian standpoint, but also the picture that should be from the American standpoint. There are two things uh, that the French are doing relatively quietly, but which are important because they are happening in what Russia considers as its you know, sphere influence or backyard. One is Armenia. Uh, France has been slowly but surely increasing its defense and security assistance to Armenia at a time where it's not only uh, attacked or aggressed by Azerbaijan, but also where the Russian, the former Russian guarantee or the protection of Russia is no longer seen as a credible or even desirable in Yerevan. The second is Moldova. We mentioned it uh, before, and I was recently in Romania, and I can sense that there's a lot of Romanian interest what France is doing in the region that we want to do with the Romanians, by the way, not uh, not separately from them. That's the reason why I mentioned the fact that perhaps, perhaps at some point, uh, there could be some, you know, Romanian-French effort in Moldova. That would have to wait up until after the presidential election. But overall, generally speaking, just like in Armenia, I think the French have been fairly eager uh, to, uh, you know, to to make sure that we have Moldova on our mental map as Europeans. You know, it's not as much as it was at the beginning of the war with the refugee crisis, but I think this is an interesting move by the French, less on the radar screen than uh, than uh, than in many uh, other cases. But it's it's once again important because of how it's seen in Russian eyes and how it should be seen. I would say in American eyes, because this is, after all, Europeans taking a little bit more of their uh, charge of their, their, the security in their, their own backyard. Yeah, I think it's such an important point. So maybe we'll stay here for just a second. I mean, because when you look at the broader picture and what Russia is doing, we, I think, all agree that it has ambitions that go far beyond Ukraine. And I think a lot of potential flashpoints would be most likely to occur on NATO's periphery, most likely uh, Moldova and Armenia, countries that have charted a uh, concertedly anti-Russian or pro-European path in a trajectory that Moscow would prefer to reverse. And so it was notable, Bruno, that France, I, I believe, announced the security guarantee to Moldova. And so um, I, yeah, so that's what, what I wanted you, this is exactly assurance. what I want you to unpack. What is it that France has done with Moldova? And again, is France ready to follow through? Because I think one of the most dangerous things that could happen is, you know, you know, some sort of uh, assurance that Moscow decides to probe. And then is France ready to follow through on that assurance? So talk to us a little bit about what France has done vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Moldova, because I think there's, again, some, um, or at least I don't fully understand what, what has happened. Look, we are recording this on the 75th anniversary of the NATO treaty. So true. the expression security guarantee uh, is uh, is important. I would differentiate it. Uh, we all know this. I'm sure that uh, those who are going to listen know the difference that that should be made between the security guarantee, like Article 5 type, and security assurances that are more that are vaguer, that are not defense commitments. Uh, you know, that's a debate we've been having regarding Ukraine, of course, for the past two years. Uh, there's no defense guarantee given by Paris to Kisinau, but we have been uh, committing ourselves to help them improve their security and with a political package messaging. Uh, with a subtext, which is we care a lot about the security of that country, which is neither a member of the EU nor a member of NATO, that does not want to uh, be a candidate for a military, joining a military bloc or otherwise, but it doesn't mean that we should not care about it. So 
I mean, I can't get into specifics at this point, but uh, expect this to be a more than just a, uh, a fling. That is, uh, I think there is a deliberate French effort to be increasingly present there to reassure Moldova and send a message to the Russians that we are watching. And by the way, the people talk all the time about Transnistria, but you know some of my Romanian uh, uh, friends and colleagues say, yeah, but that's not maybe the most important part. The Gagauzia is maybe more important. Anyway, so we're getting into maybe uh, too, too much detail here, but um, my never impression- too much Never too much detail on Brussels sprouts. Yeah, but, yeah. But this is it. Well, okay, but this is still a kind of nerdy uh, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> podcast, isn't it, right? <laughs> It is. Actually... We pride ourselves on being a nerd. <laughs> All right. So yeah, this is the the French Moldovan thing is, I think, more than just a thing. I think it's so important. I mean, it really, and I hope that other countries, including the U.S. and other European countries, uh, follow France's lead in in providing more robust support to both of those countries. I mean, again thinking of where this conflict could go and potential flashpoints, those are likely candidates. And as you said, Bruno, these are the types of steps that we'll need to send the right signals to Moscow um, that we can't continue. Tara, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on the kind of Moldova caucuses piece. Sure. Very briefly, I think maybe need to mention the fact that also France uh, was also one of the European countries alongside the UK and Germany that signed a bilateral security agreement with Ukraine, which is a 10-year agreement, a uh, 3 billion euro that will be provided in the next year. So I think there's a sense... You know, Bruno mentioned the word the word durable uh, earlier in the podcast, and I think you see the durability here too. There is a sense that we're in this for the long haul, and so this is a ten year commitment uh, on France's side. But then, in, uh, simultaneously, uh, the accession process will happen if it's approved for Ukraine and Moldova. So you mm -hmm. you will also see these two countries hopefully joining the EU, being part of this union. Uh, it's probably going to be also a different European Union than the one that we have now, because if Ukraine and Moldova are getting in, there'll be a question about the Western Balkans too. And so we're also looking at this moment where there is EU enlargement happening while there is a war in Europe. And so you need to think a lot more clearly about how the EU is supposed to be a security provider, not just for its own members, but also on its borders. And I think we're seeing an evolution here too of the European Union's role and how it perceives itself uh, as a security actor and provider, which is really key. And it's not surprising, I would say, that it's happening while we're thinking about Ukraine and Moldova getting in, also because actually Ukraine is going to be the most combat-proof uh, country in, in the Union when it gets in. And so I think this needs to be taken into account, uh, a military that will have proven its worth, but also a lot of equipment, a lot of innovation. We're seeing German and French companies, by the way, uh, where we're discussing about um, ramping up defense industrial bases, the French and the Germans and others are ramping up defense production in their own country and doing it with EU money notably, but they're also signing uh, contracts with Ukrainian companies on the ground in Ukraine to make sure that Ukraine is in a capacity to defend itself. So you're also seeing basically this happening in real time. I think that's that's really notable. Can I add something before I forget? You mentioned uh, Secretary Blinken's visit to Paris. Uh, there was one important message from Secretary Blinken. Of course, he visited a one of the biggest uh, defense equipment uh, exhibits uh, in France. So this was the occasion to talk about industry. But he mentioned the importance from the U.S. standpoint about a strong European defense industrial base, which I thought, I haven't checked the language, I have not researched into it, but it seemed to me that uh, he this particular stated support for a strong European defense industrial base was something that you don't hear every day from Washington. I mean, Jim and Andrea, you know this better than I do, but this was uh, this was fairly welcome. This was also implicitly also a message uh, to those, and Andrea and Jim and Tara, we, we were at a another meeting where we heard a former high-level uh, U.S. official who complained about Macron because he said, well, he should have consulted in the NAC. I said, oh, yeah, we we're telling this person, well, no, you can't, because if you, if you start bringing this to the NAC, then, you know, it dilutes the, uh, it dilutes the impact. It's, it suggests it creates the image of a NAC which is not united on the question, etc. So, no, I think this was the right way for Macron to do it. But then, in a sense, 
the uh, those kind of words from Secretary Blinken are also implicitly a tes- testimony to the fact that the U.S. is not mad at Macron for having uh, done this initiative. I I suppose so, at least. I don't know what you guys think, but I thought that implicitly this was a message. Uh, yes, no, Bruno, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I, um, I, I heard the same thing, and that's the first time I have ever heard anyone from the U.S. government say something along those lines. I was very glad to hear it. Um, you know, we've, there's got to be a lot of new think now. The idea of coordinating around the NAC table, I just, that just, <laughs> oh my goodness, we're in such a different place now. We are in such a different place. Let me let me ask you all in this, as we get into this different place, um, uh, you know, the idea, the, 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 the fear of and the commentary about the U.S. drifting from Europe has been around a long time. I mean, that's not new. Uh, it's And it's been around since the beginning of the alliance, because that's what NATO was supposed to do, was to keep the U.S. in. Um, so my question is, um, I think with Trump, when he was saying uh, particularly, you know, uh, you know, we uh, go ahead and let the Russians do whatever they want to do with people who don't pay up, that kind of thing. I think it really made the point, um, as well as the problems in the, in the House of Representatives getting the supplemental out, as well as the fact that if Biden even wins uh, a re-election, the Congress could go Republican and we could find ourselves in paralysis again. So I think these three things, particularly the Trump statement, has really begun to make this idea of the U.S. security guarantee not quite as believable. I mean, whereas in, in the past, it was just kind of some rhetorical things and no one really felt that the guarantee through Article 5 or or just our own rhetoric, that that was you know, going to be questioned. Now, I think, and I'm asking you all to see if, if I'm thinking right here, it seems to have really taken root in, in allied capitals. They really do think that uh, unlike in the past, there's something to this idea of of not just that the U.S. is going to drift away, but that the U.S. is not going to necessarily have the forces or the political uh, uh, juice uh, to do the things that we had promised over years that we would do. We would send troops to Europe. We'll push back on the Russians, et cetera. That, in fact, the unthinkable has happened and that on a practical basis, we might not be able to do it. And therefore, uh, Europe has got to really step up. Are you all seeing this as well, that in European capitals, whether it's Paris, but also in Southern Europe, that this that this idea about the unthinkable, the, the U.S. commitment not being as strong as it was or as credible, that in fact that's being taken on and 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 these governments are believing that that's the case. I guess, Tara, starting with you, is are you picking that up or is that just a, a, a flight of fancy? Sure. I mean, we're seeing, I think, contrary to 2017, a lot of op-eds and, you know, papers about Trump-proofing Europe, Trump-proofing NATO. Uh, a colleague from Carnegie, Sophia Besch, uh, said a few days ago, actually, we would need to Congress-proof NATO and European security. It's not just about Trump, but there is also a sea change happening in U.S. domestic politics about commitments to Europe, commitments to the international system, which we might see and which Europeans need to take into account because they are truly dependent on the American security guarantee. But, you know, as as we also know, Europeans do have means uh, to do something about it. Again, I don't think it's about so much replacing the U.S., but making sure that they're taking a lot more charge of their own security, which also makes sense, and to be able to continue working with, with the U.S. It's not so... In, ca- in the case of Trump, what is certain is like he doesn't like the EU. It's not that he doesn't like Europe so much. There, there are countries in Europe that he likes. He likes the UK. He likes Hungary and its current leader. Uh, he, you know, there would be people he could work with. I think he would like Georgia Meloni. So it's not it's not just a, a basic anti-European uh, stance. I think it's more about being anti-EU and particularly seeing the EU as um, a threat when it comes to trade for the US. So this is also I think we need to look a bit uh, with a mo- bit more granular. At, at what would uh, a Trump two administration do? But we also need to think as Europeans at what we would do with a Biden two administration, which is why I think uh, Secretary Blinken's comments in Paris were so interesting, particularly as Macron still has three years to go uh, as president of France. And he also needs to think about how to work with the US, how to work with the other European partners with the US that will truly be important, even with a Biden two administration there will be a different set of expectations on Europeans. I think we need to be clear about that. It's not just about Trump. We need to 
think about the Trump scenario. But I think actually now Europeans need to think seriously about what they would want out of a Biden administration and to understand what a Biden two administration would want of them. And so one of the questions is, of course, I think uh, the answer uh, for Macron would be European strategic autonomy. For other European partners, it could take another view. But as Europeans, with France, of course, and others, we need to think about that very seriously too. I think there is something, there is a case for Europe to be made, in particular at the NATO Washington summit. Um, look, I haven't read Sophia Bech's piece, but I'm extraordinarily wary about the expression Congress proofing NATO. I mean, it's up to our American friends to, to comment on this, but frankly, based on the fact that this is a treaty ratified by the Senate, I mean, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not sure that sending the message in Washington that you want to Congress proof something which is based on a treaty ratified by the Senate. So, but anyway, that's a, a secondary point. Uh, on Trump, look, uh, the, the short answer is yes. I can't remember what the exact question was, but the short answer is yes. Uh, six to nine months ago, the Europeans didn't want to think about the Trump scenario. Three, four months ago, they were still like, you know, deers in the headlights uh, kind of attitude. Oh my God, it's real. It can happen. But we don't want to think about it. And the uh, silver lining of his infamous comments, you know, I might even encourage Russia to attack Europe, etc., which he claims, of course, was only to, to wake us up. I think this has triggered an interesting process, which ends up with Europeans now for the first time being able to have a serious, an, an adult conversation among themselves about the what if. I've seen this in several different European countries. Now we can have that conversation without all the baggage that it carries. Oh my God, we shouldn't have, we shouldn't be having that conversation because it's going to, uh, you know, make make us look bad vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration. Oh my God, it's so bad. I don't want to think about it. No, we're having those conversation, even with countries which didn't want to have this conversation during the first Trump Monday, that is Poland and other Central European countries. So that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is two things. One, I'm not entirely certain that it prevents European countries and will prevent them from being tempted to make their own bilateral deal with a future Trump administration, with a hypothetical future Trump administration. And secondly, perhaps even more importantly, I still think that if Biden was to win, the the, the sigh of relief, I mean, there would be such a huge sigh of relief that I'm not sure that the Europeans would then think, but we have to remember that this is different from Biden won and Obama. I'm not sure at all. That's because we're facing a Trump scenario. So Biden's going to look so good and so reassuring that we would, we would be a little bit like in 2020, I suspect. You know, some of us, I mean, actually, Jim and I are old enough to remember that during the first Obama, during the first Obama administration, uh, you know, many of us in Europe thought, I didn't think it, but many around me thought, oh, this is the end. The U.S. is going to leave Europe and it's going to be entirely focused towards Asia. That some of us, like me, were saying, no, I don't think so, blah, blah, blah. But so we have to be very cautious about the hopes and expectations we may have regarding the Europeans during a second Biden administration. Now, of course, this happens in a climate, in an environment where China is very different in 2025 than it was in 2010. All right. And I think this is slowly creeping in the, the European mindset, but not yet entirely. Anyway, this is a very long way to say. Uh, do not necessarily believe that Biden too would, uh, you know, would immediately be considered by the Europeans, the Europeans as something very different from uh, Biden one. I, I and I agree with that. And just uh, Andrea, just for a second, I, I think if if Trump does not win and we get a Biden two that comes in, and there is a great sigh of relief across Europe that oh my God, we've dodged a real bullet here. I hope that European efforts to uh, build, you know, protect, institutionalize things like uh, the, the Ramstein Group or to put money into defense, that all that doesn't go away. When, when the Trump threat goes away, if everyone relaxes on their oars, that'd be the wrong thing. I would hope that we would 
that Europe would continue on its trajectory to, you know, increase capabilities and do all the things they were doing just in case Trump were to come on. Because uh, I would hate to, to, to lose that progress and to have things slow down just because Trump's no longer on the scene. Yeah. One last question, maybe. So there's obviously the, the risks that stem from the U.S. and the less credible U.S. commitment. And then we've been talking primarily about the Russia threat. So I want to just end on that note. And I had one question that I've been thinking about this whole time, which is how are French people thinking about and understanding the nature of the Russia threat? So we've heard so many statements from you know, the head of Intel services in Estonia that we have to prepare for war in two to four years, a German statement from their minister of defense. And France really has been the target of quite a lot of Russian aggression, um, a, the, the a French organization uncovering a very massive influence campaign in the run up to the European elections, et cetera, et cetera. So, but is that being felt by French people? Do people is it a, an an issue? I mean, obviously, it wouldn't be the same the way that it is in the Baltics or other countries right on Russia's borders. But how is it being felt and understood, do you think, in France? Could I jump in on that, Andrea, just for a second? So I asked my favorite antique dealer here in Paris that same question. I, I always go to her when I want what the French people are thinking. And she's I mean, when I say she's an antique dealer, she's not a high end, sophisticated. She's she's a low end. <laughs> That's where I shop is low end. But she told me, I asked her that same thing. And she said, Jim, she says, when France, when the French people think war is coming, they put money aside. They don't spend money. They, they've been here before. And she goes, uh, I have seen over the past six months, all my French friends are putting money away. They're putting money away because they smell war coming. She says, as far as I'm concerned, the, American, the, the uh, French people know what's getting ready to happen because they're getting ready for it by putting their money away. I thought that was very interesting. So yeah. I thought I would just add that color to your question. But Bruno's going to disagree. I'm going to disagree with your favorite art or antique dealer. Uh, I think that for the French, up until a month and a half ago, the idea that the Ukraine war was our war, that Russia could once again become a direct military threat to the Western part of the continent was something which, which was very far away from the mind, French mindset. If only because, I mean, it's, let's start with something to do, simple, because of geography. This is very different from when we had uh, the uh, uh, Western group of forces uh, of the Warsaw Pact a few hundred kilometers literally away from the French border. What has changed is that Macron's stance has suddenly uh, created a debate which is reverberating in the campaign for the European election, according to which, oh, uh, maybe we're going to be at war with Russia because of Macron. Not because of Russia, because of Macron. And the problem is that what you rightly referred to, Andrew or Jim, is the, the huge Russian effort at cyber attack and disinformation. There have been many cyber attacks against governmental infrastructure in recent weeks. I mean, Russia is already at war with us, information-wise, cyber-wise. But this is not really visible for the French public. So... There is a tension, a mis mismatch, so to say, between the government perception and uh, public opinion perception. But I don't sense the French as worried as the Danes, the Estonians, or the Finns. Uh, however, because of Macron's stance, they're slightly more worried, especially among the younger people, than they were a month and a half ago. It, so how is this playing into the European election campaign? Well, so like national rally and other things, do they, I mean, do they take yes, quite well, a different position? That's the, that's the reason why, uh, that's the reason why actually I don't think, the, some people said, you know, Macron did this for domestic political purposes. Nonsense. Nonsense because it was a huge gamble from a domestic, domestic political sentiment because it opened up a space where the national rally and the, 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 and the radical left could say no to war. We are campaigning on a no to war platform. So I thought it was quite a gamble. Para, your views? Yeah, I think, well, they, the far right and the far left are definitely weaponizing this. 
for their own campaigns. And so you're seeing a lot of people on TV, on radio saying, well, you know, we don't want to go to war for the Donbass. We don't want to go to war for Ukraine when nobody is asking them to go to war. They are saying, and so this is also a reflection of, of previous debates of decades ago, uh, the far right and the far left are saying we are the parties of peace and the the party in government is the party of war. And so when you, when you tell them, well, you know, we're now actually the person who's who struck Ukraine and who is attacking Ukraine on a daily basis is Putin and Putin's Russia. So it's, you know, the only party of war here is Putin and Russia. It's not anybody else. But it is, they are weaponizing it a lot in the debate. And I think that's why Macron's comments also were weaponized in the in the French debate and in the ramp up to, uh, to the European elections there. But, you know, the thing is, the results are going to be really scary for Europe as well of these European elections. For now in France, at least, um, uh, the national rally might outnumber the, the Macron's party one to two. So that is quite scary. Um, far right and far left populists are set to top uh, the results of the election in nine EU member states with, you know, it, the thing is, foreign policy is not going to decide the European elections, but it, these elections might have a huge impact on European foreign policy. So we need to remind that. Well, there's so much more we could get into, and we'll have to save it for a future podcast. But this was really interesting. There is just so much happening all over Europe, not least in Paris. And we really appreciate all of your insights and in helping us understand what's going on. So Tara and Bruno, thanks so much. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of Brussels Sprouts, brought to you by the Transatlantic Security Team at the Center for a New American Security. You can find all of our previous episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And please remember to rate and review Brussels Sprouts so that new listeners are able to find the show.